better do it justice now. Um, if you wouldn't mind turning with me please um, to Colossians, uh, letter to the Colossians uh, and chapter number one please. Colossians chapter one and um, we'll start reading from verse number 15 please. And it says there, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created, that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist and he is the head of the body the church who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead that in all things he might have the preeminence for it pleased the father that in him should all fullness dwell let me just read one more passage please um that's found in three john third epistle of john please um, and we'll just read from verse number 9. 3 John and verse number 9. And it says, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, Neither does he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil has not seen God. We pray that God will bless those readings to us uh, this evening from his word. Now this evening I'd like to speak with you um, about the glories of of the Son of God, particularly from these three or four verses that we've read here in Colossians um, chapter 1. And I just really want to this evening go through these various different titles which we have here for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I hope just as we do these things um, and look through these different things that we might just maybe wonder afresh, have a fresh appreciation for the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and see all that he's accomplished um, through his death and his resurrection. You see, there is a serious danger um, that our hearts can possibly grow cold or our hearts um, can possibly grow away from the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the sense, you remember in the church uh, in Ephesus in Revelation 2, you remember everything looked as if it was going so well from the surface, but in reality the Lord had that one thing against them, which was that they had left their first love. And so Tonight, humbly, we hope that we might just be encouraged to learn more of our Saviour, learn more of the Lord Jesus Christ, and to worship and adore him for all that he has done. Now, before just going in to consider that subject, I think it would be helpful just to have a short overview um, of this book of Colossians, and just so that we can have a little bit of context to these verses that we're considering this evening. So just three things I'd like to pull out from um, this letter. Firstly, we want to think about the penman, or the writer, I'm going for alliteration here, so the pen man. Now we want to think about the creature, and lastly we want to think about the person. First of then the pen man, so the writer of this book, and as most of you will know, the writer of the letter of the Colossians was the Apostle Paul. And that's confirmed for us in the, the first verse, uh, chapter 1 and verse number 1, and it's also confirmed for us in the last verse of Colossians, chapter 4 and verse 18. As well as that, Paul was clearly at the time writing from prison. You remember in chapter 4, in verse number 3, he will speak about how he is in bonds. And so Paul is the writer and he is writing from prison. It is quite clear though from chapter number 2 that the people that Paul is writing to, he has in fact never seen face to face. He's been informed about them. Someone has come and, and told him about what is happening there in Colossae and in the surrounding area. And I'll, we'll touch on that person in a minute. But Paul has never met these people face to face. And he's going to send them a letter 
but he's not going to send them a letter only. You see, there's a, there's a strand that kind of runs through Colossians, and it is the prayer life of the Apostle Paul. You know, long before this letter came to these saints, the Apostle Paul and others were making prayers for these saints. And it's lovely to think that though he hadn't seen them face to face, he, they were the subject of his prayers. In verse number three of the first chapter, he speaks of praying always for you. In verse nine of the same chapter, he says that ever since we've heard of you, we haven't ceased to pray for you. We're praying for you consistently, constantly. Mm-hmm. In chapter two, he'll speak about how what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. There was Paul imprisoned in these awful circumstances, far from desirable circumstances, and he's found praying, not for his own situation, he's found praying for the preservation and for the advancement of these saints. And I suppose then at a high level, the letter to the Colossians uh, is really an informative look on the personal prayer life for the Apostle Paul, and there's much that we can learn from that. And so that's the pen man, the Apostle Paul, writing to people he had never yet met. Then there's the preacher. Um, And uh, if you look at verse number seven of the first chapter, uh, you'll see who this is. Paul mentions a man called Epaphras. Now, unlike the Apostle Paul, he had physically spent a lot of time with these saints, clearly. We read of him in verse number seven, as I say, and then at the end end of the book in chapter number four, and this man, Epaphras, he's, accred- he's credited by Paul for bringing the gospel to these Colossians. He had brought the gospel to them. They had heard it. They had believed it. And now they had come to know the grace of God in truth. Colossians 1 and 6. But this man, he had a deep care for these saints. It was a care that went past their conversion. It wasn't simply that he preached the gospel and that was, that was how he washed his hands off them. No, he had a care for these saints. And so he brings news to Paul about what is happening with these saints. But just like Paul, he's praying for the saints. I love this. Paul says in chapter 4 that he was always labouring fervently for you in prayers. Colossians 4 and 12. Always labouring fervently for you in prayers. And again, he'll speak of them and he'll say, For I bear him record that he has great zeal for you in them in Laodicea and Aeropolis. This was a man who cared about the saints, who loved the saints. And because of his service, Paul gives him a few titles in the book that are worth noting. In the first chapter, he'll call him a dear fellow servant. Again, he'll call him a faithful minister of Christ. Again, he'll call him a servant of Christ at the end of the book. And here was a remarkable brother whose love for the saints is evidently seen in what he's doing. He is praying for them. It's that act of love that John speaks about in 1 John. You remember he says, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And that's what this dear brother was doing. And what an accolade he is forever remembered in scripture as a faithful minister of Christ. And so that's the pen man, Paul. That's the preacher, Epaphras. Well, what about the person? Well, maybe you were able to tell uh, what person this book is all about just from those few first verses that we read. The person that the book is all about is the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul will, in this letter, dwell much on the work and much on the worth of the Lord Jesus Christ as we learn in this letter what Christ is to the church. And this teaching about Christ was very much needed because even if you just went home and had a brief reading of the letter of the Colossians, it would be clear to see that there was much false teaching which was all around these saints. And these false teachings that were being circulated, they did not rightly regard the glory of the person of Christ or of his work. And so Paul will speak to these saints and he will warn them. He'll warn them against philosophy and vain deceit. It's after the traditions of men, it's after the rudiments of this world, but crucially, not after Christ. He'll warn them about Judaizing teachings and he'll say, they're a shadow of things to come. 
but the body is of Christ. He'll warn them against uh, any man beguiling them out of their reward in a voluntary humility and worshipping of angels. And he explains that they're speaking of things that they've not seen. These things are coming from a puffed up fleshly mind, crucially not holding the head, which as we'll see in a minute, is Christ. And so the principle then for exposing all of these false teachings is teaching concerning Christ. When measured against the person and the work of Christ, the evil of these false teachings is uncovered. And so throughout the book, we find Paul declaring for us the all-sufficiency of Christ, declaring for us the glories of Christ. And it's some of these glories uh, that we want to think about in our section of scripture this evening. So we've seen the penman Paul and the preacher Epaphras, and finally the person that this book is all about, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's come back to think just about our passage this evening. Uh, and just in order to help us understand this passage, uh, there's just one key word which I'd like to, to highlight for you that we can maybe just keep in our minds as we look through the passage this evening. And that key word is found in verse number 18. And it's the word preeminence or the preeminence. Interestingly, the Greek word which is used here in verse number 18 for the preeminence only appears here in our New Testament. And the meaning behind that word is to be first or to hold the first place. And so if you have another translation, it might read something like that he might have the first place in all things or so that in everything he might have the supremacy. And this is the meaning of the verses that we're going to be considering tonight. They're explaining for us clearly that in everything, in all things, Christ holds first place, that he has superiority. Whether it is creation, as we'll think about in a minute, or whether it is the new creation, Christ is the preeminent one. And so this is the thought we want to keep in the back of our heads as we go through uh, this passage this evening. Now, one more thing just to point out, um, which hopefully will help us in our understanding of this thought of preeminence. Now, as I said, the Greek word which is used in Colossians chapter 1 only appears here. But the thought of preeminence and the English word for preeminence appears elsewhere in Scripture. And I suppose it will depend what translation you have, but if you've got the King James translation, it appears again in 3 John. And that was where we read from uh, this evening, that's where we took our second reading. Not the same Greek word, but the thought of preeminence is there. We read of a man called Diotrephes, who loveth to have preeminence among them. But the Greek word is different here. The word for preeminence is different entirely to the one that's used in Colossians 1. Instead, the word that's there is used to convey someone who aspires to preeminence. Someone who desires to be first. Hence the translation, who loves to have the preeminence. And this is what's said about the Diotrephes. He aspired to preeminence. He wanted to be first and in a particular realm amongst God's people. And we'll come back and think about him a little bit later on tonight. But just at the outset, it's helpful for us to just take note of these two different instances of preeminence in Scripture just to help us understand the difference here. In 3 John, preeminence is an aspiration or the desire of this man in a particular realm. In Colossians 1, the preeminence of Christ is not an aspiration, it's not a desire, it is a reality. And due to who he is and what he has done, it is a reality. We don't only see uh, preeminence as well in a particular realm, as with this man, Diotrephes, but we see it unequivocally everywhere. He holds first place, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And with that said, let's just look um, at this section uh, this evening under these two headers. Firstly, we want to think um, about the preeminence of Christ in relation to the creation, and that will cover off verses 15, 16, and 17. And secondly, we want to think about the preeminence of Christ in relation to the new creation, and that will cover off verse number 18. Now, evidently, preeminence in creation and preeminence in 
the new creation, can only belong to God himself. And so this section is, is bookended, if you like, start and end, with reference to the deity of Christ. We'll consider verse number 15, probably not verse number 19, but we'll consider verse number 15 to notice that. And whilst we firmly stand on the truth of the deity of Christ, there's those who are going to maybe come to you in the street or come and knock your door and use these very verses to try and disprove the deity of Christ. And so we'll be careful tonight just to show how wrong they are in that assertion. First of all, let's just look at that opening statement in verse number 15. And then we'll go on to think about the preeminence of Christ in relation to both creation and the new creation. So we read in verse number 15, who is the image of the invisible God, who is the image of the invisible God. First, we just notice that word, who. This links us back to verse number 13. And there we learn who it is that Paul is speaking about. The who is his dear son, or if you prefer, the son of his love. And so we begin then with one who is the son, who is loved by the father. And you'll remember that in John 17, we're told that that love was there even before the foundations of the world. Notice too how God is described in the verse. He's called the invisible God. And we find that thought being expressed often in scripture. Remember, John will say, no man has seen God at any time. Paul will say to Timothy, now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. In the Old Testament, we find that as well, Exodus 33 in that well-known section. For there shall no man see me and live. And so we have his dear son, the son of his love. And we have the invisible God. And we realise that the son of his love is the image of the invisible God. And what we're learning is that in the son of his love, we see what God is. John writes, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. He is the one who in his person perfectly displays the very nature and moral attributes of God. And so when we want to understand God's love, where do we look? We look to Christ. We want to understand his grace. We look to Christ. We want to understand his holiness. We look to Christ, his mercy, his righteousness, his thoughts towards sin, his thoughts towards unrighteousness, his thoughts towards false religion, and so on. We can see it in the Lord Jesus Christ. The invisible God is perfectly seen in him. Something, by the way, which would be impossible apart from the fact of him being God himself. You see, this is not a likeness to God. But the reality is he is the image of the invisible God. And so when Philip says in, in uh, John 14, um, Lord, show us the Father and it will suffice us. That will satisfy us. The Lord can say an absolute truth to Philip. He that has seen me has seen the Father. Let's move on then just to um, the, the, the next section, which I said we wanted to consider. And that's the preeminence of Christ in relation to creation. Four statements we'll find in this section. Firstly, we'll see that he is the firstborn of every creature. Secondly, we'll see that all things were created by him and for him. Thirdly, we'll see that he is before all things. And fourthly, we'll see that by him all things consist. Firstly then in verse number 15, we read that he is the firstborn of every creature. Now this statement, as I alluded to earlier, we need to handle with care, as many people use this statement to try um, and uh, attempt to suggest that God had somehow created the Lord Jesus Christ. But as we'll see in just a minute, that error is actually contradicted by the following verse. Because as we'll see in a second, all things were created by him. So how could he himself be a created being? But anyway, uh, we'll come to that in a second. But let's think about that word, firstborn. Now firstborn, besides its primary meaning, is often found in scripture in a figurative sense, sometimes to uh, denote rank or superiority. For example, in Exodus chapter 4, uh, we'll read um, that it says, And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my son. 
firstborn. Now, Israel wasn't the first amongst the nations. In fact, right now they're a group of slaves who are being kept captive in Egypt. They're not the first of the nations upon the earth, but they are God's chosen nation. As well as that, Jacob, who was later named Israel, you remember, he wasn't the first of his father's sons. No, remember he had an older brother called Esau. Yet, this nation, God says, is my firstborn. And so they're called firstborn, why? Down to their rank, down to their superiority, down to that unique relationship which they had with God. Again, we come to Psalm 89. And it says, I will make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. Now, David is mentioned in the context, but this is clearly uh, messianic. Um, and it's speaking to us of the reign of Christ. And again, it's all to do with position and rank. It's nothing to do with dates and times. I will make him my firstborn. Again, we come to Jeremiah 31 and, and 9. I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. You would remember when you come to Genesis uh, 48, Israel stretched out his hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger. So clearly, again, firstborn is here, is not relating to date or time. Firstborn is not relating to who it was that was born first. There's other examples that we could pick on, but hopefully that will suffice just to show that oftentimes firstborn in Scripture is used um, to signify preeminence and is used to signify rank. And so when we come to Colossians 1 and 15, it's not really a strange thing, or certainly wouldn't have been to these believers a strange or uncommon thing um, to see the Apostle Paul using the word firstborn in this way. And as we said, the following verse really confirms that that is the context of Firstborn. So we learn, when applied to Christ in relation to creation, that the word firstborn here, nothing to do with date or time, but instead everything to do with preeminence, superiority, and rank. Mm. Now you may be asking the question, how is Christ superior over creation? How is he preeminent? Well, our following verse gives us the answer. There we read, for, or if you like, because by him were all things created. He stands forth absolutely preeminent over creation for the simple reason that he is the creator and he is the sustainer of it, as we'll see in a second. In him it was created, he designed it. Through him it was created, he built it. And unto him it was created, he is its aim. Someone yeah, put it like this, he is the architect of creation. He is the agent of creation and he is the aim of creation. Look at the expanse of those things which are created by him as well. It's all things, the universe of things, whether those be things in heaven or things in earth, whether those be things that are visible to us or invisible to us, whether they be material powers or spiritual powers, all things were created by him and for him, whatever way you cut it, all things come back to the sun. John will use the exact same terminology, won't he, when it comes to write his gospel, the third verse, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Mm. Why then worship angels? Why then put Christ on the same level as these uh, Colossians were being warned against doing? Because as we see from this verse, he's the very creator of these things. He is superior to them all. Not only this, but Paul goes on to say, he is before all things. And we're reminded of what we've already considered. He is the eternal one, the pre-existent one. Remember, John the Baptist could say, he that comes after me is preferred before me. Why? Because he was before me. Although you, you, you would go obviously go to um, Luke's gospel and you would look at the account there and you would say, wait a minute, John the Baptist was born first. Christ came after. How was it that he was before him? Well, it's because Christ is the eternal one. Remember, Christ will say again in John's gospel, before Abraham was, I am. Abraham had been born many hundreds of years before. Yet before Abraham was, he was. Why? Because he's the eternal one. Mm 
What about creation? What about those ancient mountains that are all around us that have likely stood for uh, goodness knows how many years? What about the earth that stood for so long as well? Is he before these things? The psalmist writes in Psalm 90, Before the mountains were brought forth. Or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. He is from everlasting to everlasting. He is before all things, before the stars ever shined, before a, a blade of grass ever grew in the earth, before man took his first breath. He is. He is ever before anything existed outside of time, the ancient of days, the ever existent one the eternal one, unoriginated and underived. Not only this, but Paul finishes the section with this thought, by him all things consist. And again we find these words, all things, I should have pointed it out sooner, but you'll notice that all things that appear in all of these verses, all things were created by him and for him, he's before all things, and now by him all things consist, or hold together and all things continues in Colossians uh, 1 that we won't think about tonight. You see, it's not simply the case that Christ created all things, but it's also the case that Christ maintains all things. This creation, in all of its various parts, is held together by the sun. You know, mankind would seek with knowledge and science to, to, to exclude God from creation altogether. But the reality is, in the experiments and the observations and the, the discovery of all of these constants that they find, it only goes to prove that there is one who holds it all together. Mm. There is the Son who holds everything together, and without him, everything would be chaos, and everything would be destruction. Hebrews 1 gives us a similar thought, upholding all things by the power of his word. And there's much more we could say about these things, but hopefully that will suffice to show the superiority or the preeminence of Christ in relation to the creation. We've seen that unique title that belongs to him as firstborn, and we've seen the reasons for it. Because he has made all things, because he is before all things, and lastly, as we saw, because he holds all things together, even unto this day. In the remaining um, verse 18 that we have, Paul is now going to switch focus. No more is his aim to show the preeminence of Christ as in creation, but instead it's now to show the preeminence of Christ in relation to the church, or if you like, in relation to the new creation. And we'll notice though that there will be clear parallels with what we've already considered and what we are going to consider now. We've noted already that he is the one who originated and maintains <coughs> creation. And now we'll see him as the same thing, but for the church, the originator and the maintainer of the church. Three statements just to consider in this section. Firstly, he is the head of the body, the church. Secondly, who is the beginning? And lastly, uh, who is the firstborn from the dead? Firstly, then it's said of the Son that he is the head of the body, the church. Just notice with me again that the characters that we have in this statement. So we have the head, and of course we're still speaking about the Son of his love here, and we'll think in a minute about what his ministry is to the church in that particular role as head. Then there is the body, which we learn from our passage is the church. Now, in the context here, the church is not so much being viewed as a, a local company of believers that are gathered to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, such as uh, when Paul writes to the Corinthians, you remember he speaks of the church of God, which is at Corinth. Not so much the idea here, but instead we have the church, which is embrace of, of all believers from Pentecost till rapture. And so we have this picture of the head and the body, and perhaps initially that would just emphasise for us that vital connection between the risen Christ and his church. As someone helpfully put it, headship involves Christ being the one to whom the body owes its life and from whom it derives sustenance. Now let's just think this evening um, and consider a little bit, as I mentioned, the ministry of the head to the body. And for that, we'd really need to go to the letter of the Ephesians. Now, as most would know, the letter to the Colossians and the letter to the Ephesians share very many similarities and also um, one or two contrasts. And I don't really want to spend time sketching all of these out 
this evening, whether that's a study in itself, but there is one common theme which we find in both of these books. It's what we're considering in this title, How Christ is the Head of the Church. One thing just to note if you are looking at these things, and both books do, do have the same theme, but both books will come at it from slightly different perspectives. In Colossians, we learn what Christ is to the church, and in Ephesians, it's almost a bit like the reverse, what the church is to Christ. But regardless, when we come to the letter of the Ephesians, we see this truth about Christ as the head of the church. And so when I come to chapter 1, I read um, there uh, that he gave him to be head, um, gave him to be the head over all to the church, which is the body. When I come to chapter 4, I read about speaking the truth in love that we may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted and so on. And then when I come to chapter 5, I read about Christ again as the head of the church. But there I see that, that truth in connection with husbands and wives. And we read there, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. And Paul, this is his initial premise for what he'll go on to speak about. He's going to apply this principle now to the relationship between a husband and and a wife, and I don't so much want to speak on that, but I want to just pick out um, the things here which tell us about what Christ is um, to his church. And so Paul says, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. And so we're learning firstly that Christ, as the head, is the authority over the church. He directs, and controls the body and the church should be subject to him following his commands that's what the verse said the church is subject unto christ and so firstly we see his authority as the head of the church and you might think well jason that's a bit of a trivial truth we're not too concerned about that today well uh, i was just thinking about this um passage earlier and i was reminded of my, my days at school and we were taught about these people who stood for this very truth in this country just about 300 or 400 years ago and they were put to death just for admitting the fact that Christ was the authority in the church. It wasn't a government, it wasn't a king, it wasn't a queen, but it was Christ who was the authority. So no trivial truth, people laid down their lives for it and we should appreciate it today. Not only do we see Christ as the head as having authority of the church, but in uh, Ephesians 5 we also learn of his love for the church. It says there in verse number 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And we see that the church is the object of his love. And he has proved that love by giving himself for it. You know, the love of Christ for the believer is not just seen in the big picture, to call it that way. But it's seen in the individual sense too. And I was just um, almost surprised, I guess, just how similar the language here is in in Galatians 2 and 20, Paul says there, the Son of God that loved me and gave himself for me, brothers and sisters, he gave himself for the church, but he gave himself for me. And I know um, that, that instruction there to love is really one for husbands and wives in the context, but the love of Christ is something we're all called to replicate. And that to one another. You remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ in the upper room, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. And so we see his love for the church. Lastly, we see his care for the church. It says, Therefore no man ever yet hates his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, even as the Lord the church, for we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. How does he nourish and how does he cherish the church? Well, perhaps... Ephesians 4 would give us a bit of an uh, answer to that question. You remember there we read about how there's gifts which have been given. And what is the purpose? What is the reason for those gifts? For the perfecting of the saints? For the, ministry, for the work of the ministry? For the edifying of the body of Christ? Gifts are given then for the maintaining and the development of the church. And so Paul will instruct Timothy and tell him, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift you have. And brothers and sisters, just like to encourage us not to neglect the gift which we have 
been given. We've seen that our gift has been given for a reason. Our gift has been given for a purpose, a purpose which is greater than ours. So we ought to be exercising that gift which has been given to us whenever we can. And so we see Christ as the head of the church. We see that uh, in, in respect to his authority. We see Christ having loved the church and we see Christ nourishing and cherishing the church. Authority, love and care. And it reminded me of uh, a little hymn that we sometimes sing. In the first part of the verse goes, The church shall never perish, her dear Lord to defend, to guide, sustain and cherish is with her to the end. Next we read who is the beginning. And as with our previous statement, this too is connected to the new creation. And we see that he is its origin. That's really the thought behind the word beginning. It's the originating power or the origin or the source. And uh, someone put it a lot better than me, so I thought I would just uh, share it with you. Someone said that headship, it takes care of authority. It safeguards the thought of rule and control. While the beginning puts before us the idea of creative initiative. So he is the origin, the originating um, source. But just to move on to our last point, so I would like to uh, get to uh, 3 John before we finish tonight. Uh, we read there that he, in verse number 18, for the last point, that he is the firstborn from the dead. He's the firstborn from the dead. And again, we encounter this word firstborn, which we noted just a moment ago that this term can be used figuratively in scripture, oftentimes to speak about first in rank or priority. And so firstborn from the dead refers to dignity, refers to priority, refers to preeminence. You see, his resurrection was different altogether from all other resurrections. All other resurrections were really a matter of the mercy of God that they were raised. You remember in the case of Lazarus or in the case of the widow's son and so on. But with Christ, it was what was due to him. For death had no claim upon him. He had power to lay down his life and he had power to take it up again. And now he is risen, never to die again. Now he is ascended. He is the head of a new race. He is the one who is now in the glory. As well as the reality of his resurrection, this, this title also reminds us that the reality of his resurrection is the pledge of our resurrection should we need it. You see, Paul will say to the Corinthians that if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, you are yet in your sins, and they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. You know, if Christ is not raised, our faith is in vain. <coughs> We're still in our sins. Those who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ sadly have perished. And as a result, we're of most men to be pitied. That's what happens if Christ has not risen from the dead. But I love what Paul goes on to say. It's almost the triumph. He says, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits. Afterwards they that are Christ at his coming. And last week uh, we attended uh, two funerals of two sisters in Christ and we helped to lower them into the grave. But we did so, um, and we remembered at, at the funeral, we did so with the absolute assurance and the absolute hope that because he has raised from the dead, that they too would raise in a future day. Not only raise, but be changed. And that's the wonderful truth. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And though we don't wait for the grave, instead we await for his coming, it's good for us to remember that death cannot separate us from the promises of God. Our hope extends beyond the grave, and it does so why? Because he is the first one from the dead. And so in this section of scripture, we see that in all th we see the truth, as we've been saying all along, that in all things he might have the preeminence. This is the goal of Paul. This is what he's been writing about. He's trying to show us that it has been ordained by God that in all things Christ would have the preeminence would have first place in all things, whether we think about the creation, whether we think about the church. Christ has preeminence. He is the superior one. He holds first place in all things. 
just two practical points uh, to bring out uh, from the passage and then um, we'll sit down. Firstly, I'd just like to mention Diotrephes, who we read about um, at the start um, of our meeting. And we read, just to remind you, um, that he was one who loved to have the preeminence among them. Here was someone who, as we thought, in reality, was not the preeminent one, but he desired to be. He desired to hold top place, if you like, uh, amongst God's people. His attitude, it might just remind us of the warning that Peter gives. You remember in Peter 5, uh, and he's speaking really to elders, and he says, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but examples to the flock. You know, this man, Diotrephes, he might have very well been a prominent brother in the assemblies. Perhaps he was a man who was gifted. You know, John really doesn't tell us. But the reality is, anything that he might have been was being spoiled by this fact that he loved to have first place amongst God's people. And look at his behaviour. You see, that is really just the fruit. His behaviour is really just the fruit of a self-important heart. He received us not, uh, John writes. And perhaps the thought is that he didn't acknowledge their authority as he should have done. He says he's prating against us with malicious words or he's talking wicked nonsense against us. It was wicked. It was malicious words and it was complete nonsense. He says, he goes on to say, neither does he himself receive the brethren and forbiddeth them that would and cast them out of the church. He's refusing to accept the Lord's servant. He's throwing people out who would accept them. And this is a warning really for us in scripture. A warning against self-importance. A warning against a love for the first place among the saints. And we need to be on guard for this because we all have the flesh in us and the tendency of the flesh is thoughts of self-importance, is thoughts of preeminence, is thoughts of jealousy. But as we learn from this passage, these thoughts, they don't lead to anything which is good or profitable. They lead to malicious words. They lead to violent behaviours. And so what does Paul say to the saints in Philippi? He says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. You know, the assembly should not be the place where we love to have the preeminence. Instead, it should be the place where we acknowledge and love to remember that Christ is the preeminent one. The last challenge I want to leave with you and it's a challenge really for my own heart and I've felt it myself, which is why I'd like to share it. But I just want to challenge us on our appreciation of the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we all live in uh, busy worlds and there's much to take up our time and much to fill our minds. There's many legitimate things we're involved in, and probably many illegitimate things as well um, that we shouldn't bother with. But I wonder if we're just taking time, whether it's out of our day or out of our week, taking time to study and taking time to dwell on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. You know, we have been saved. We have new life with Christ. There's something better for us to be taken up with yeah. than whatever the rest of this world wants to be <clears throat> taken up with. And what is the greatest thing we can be taken up with? It's the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. I wonder, are we captivated by his beauty or have our hearts just grown cold? Are we like that church at Ephesus that we left our first love? You know, we were back in that Scotland a wee while ago, um, an elderly brother in ministry uh, said that when we cease to worship, what, when we cease to wonder, we cease to worship. When we cease to wonder, we cease to worship. And I hope we never lose the wonder, just to the amazement of the Christ who died for us and who gave himself for us. Now, when considering this passage this evening, uh, there's something which, uh, a, ver uh, a hymn which came to my mind, and I'll just share a few verses um, of it, and then um, I'll sit down. And maybe you know the hymn. It says, Hast thou heard him, seen him, known him? Is not thine a captured heart? Chief among ten thousand own him, joyful choose the better part. What has stripped the seeming beauty from the idols of the earth? Not a sense of right or duty, but the sight of peerless worth. Not the crushing of those idols with its bitter void and smart, but the beaming of his beauty, the unveiling of his heart. Tis that look that melted Peter, 
Tis that face that Stephen saw. Tis that heart that wept with Mary, can a bone from idol straw. Captivated by his beauty, worthy tribute haste to bring. Let his peerless worth constrain me, crown him now, unrivalled King. May God would just bless his word to us this evening.